Well, good morning, everybody. Time to take a nice deep breath in. Deep breath in and hold it for just a moment. And exhale. And welcome to Unity Center of Davis. I'm Reverend Rich Carlini. And here at Unity Center of Davis, we welcome you in the name and in the nature of that living Christ presence. That Christ presence that lives and dwells in the heart of each and every one of us. We also honor the many faces of God and the many paths to God. And with that being said, let's celebrate social justice this morning as we sing, If I Had a Hammer. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, I'd hammer in the evening, all over this land. I'd hammer out a danger, I'd hammer out a warning, I'd hammer out love between my brothers and my sisters, oh, this land If I had a bell I'd ring it in the morning I'd ring it in the evening All over this land I'd ring it in danger I'd ring it in war Brothers and sisters, all over this land. If I had a song, I'd sing it in the morning, I'd sing it in the evening, all over this land. I'd sing out a day. I'd sing out a warning, I'd sing out a love between my brothers and my sisters, oh, 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 over this land. Well, I've got a hammer, and i got a bell, and I've got a song to sing all over this land it's the hammer of justice it's the bell of freedom it's a song about love between my brothers and my sisters all over this land it's a hammer of justice it's the bell of freedom it's a song about love between my brothers and my sisters oh over this land now would you please join me in a time of prayer Good morning, God. We take a moment to connect with the breath and open our hearts to prayer. And we have a lot to pray about this morning. We have a lot to open our hearts to guidance and love and compassion and empathy. And we do, we open our hearts to each of those right now. As we sang that song this morning, If I Had a Hammer, I saw last night on public television, Trini Lopez singing it. Trini Lopez made his transition this past week. And so we, we thank Trini for his time here with us on this pla earthly plane and congratulate him for his work in the music industry and for bringing that song to us in a in a different fashion than Peter, Paul, and Mary did. 
we wrap all those that are involved in the fires in California in our hearts and prayers right now. We see them safe, protected, filled with the love of God. We wrap our fellow congregants at the Vacaville Church in our prayers. We know that the Vacaville Church is standing and that Reverend Dahlia is doing fine, even though she was evacuated. But we hold those congregants that lost their homes in our prayers. We see them abundant. We see them prospering. We see them filled with confident living. We see them filled with hope and faith. We see them imagining what's next and having the faith to bring that forward. We hold all those suffering from COVID-19 in our prayers. And we see each of us in this world creating a different reality, a reality without COVID-19, a reality filled with love, a reality filled with spiritual understanding and spiritual wisdom. Loving God, thank you for this opportunity to come together this morning in worship in service, in joyful connection, and in prayer. Thank you, God. Amen. And now we will do the blessing for our world. If we'll all join us in saying, we love you, we bless you, we appreciate you, and we behold God's love as you. Amen. And now let us prepare for meditation. Spirit, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you Spirit, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. join together now in a time of meditation. I invite you to take a few moments to relax, feel your breathing, recognize as you breathe in and you breathe out. You share the atmosphere of the earth with all living creatures. Through this atmosphere, we are one. We let our breath remind us of that fundamental unity of all life, and our participation in that. I invite you today to contemplate, focus your attention on the idea and the feeling of oneness. 
The idea of oneness is the idea of the, the truth, the interconnection of all things. Just as we breathe the same air and are warmed by the same sun and stand upon the same earth with all living creatures, so our thoughts, our words, and our actions play a part in this tapestry, in this tricks of unity. We are one. One not only with that which can be seen and sensed, but that which is unseen and unsensed. That those dimensions of reality that we feel intuitively, this oneness is not just an idea, but also a feeling, many feelings. And we experience love, compassion, empathy, warmth of others. We are feeling oneness, even as we may hold in our thoughts the idea of oneness. And underlying all this, underlying this fundamental unity of the universe, visible and invisible, is the infinite one we call God. In unity, we affirm the idea that there is one presence and one power in the universe and in our lives. God the good. We may call God the universe or spirit, infinite mind. We may even use personal names for God, like Yahweh. Some use the word Allah. Others, Brahma. By whatever name, the reality is the same. One presence, one power, one mind, including all feeling, pervading all things within us, all around us, and everyone we think of. God the good, God the infinite mind, of wisdom and intelligence, the infinite presence of love and understanding. We open ourselves completely now to this oneness, to God, to mind, spirit, love. In this awareness, we bring into our own fields of awareness those we love, Anyone who may be in your heart or mind today, bring them into this awareness of oneness. This knowing that there is a power at work in their lives for good, power of love and intelligence, power of life. One presence, one power is at work in each one, manifesting as guidance, as healing, as supply, as whatever is needed to move them forward on life's journey. As we support others, others support us. So we rejoice and are grateful that we are never in any situation alone. We are supported by infinite spirit and by that spirit working through others of courage and heart. Bless us with their work and their words, even as we bless others with our works and our words. I invite you now to rest in that healing, guiding, and prospering presence, that consciousness of the infinite one that pervades all things, to simply rest in that and feel that and let it do its perfect work in you right now in silence.
We bring our attention back to our breathing and our surroundings. We remain centered, this consciousness of oneness, this consciousness of love that brings us peace, light, life, and love. We know that as we hold this consciousness, we bless everyone we think of and we are blessed. And in that we are so grateful. Pray in the consciousness of the Christ and know that this oneness is now manifesting in our world, in us, as us and through us. And so it is. Amen. Maybe we can never house the homeless Rid the streets of violence and crime Make the world a safe place for our children But we can try Maybe we can never feed the hungry Chase every war plane from the sky do away with ignorance and hatred, but we can try. Sometimes I feel so helpless, but I can just do my best. Cause even the longest journey begins with a single step. Maybe we won't always find forgiveness To our wildest dreams the wings to fly Maybe we won't always love our neighbor But we can try wildest dreams the wings to fly maybe we won't always love our neighbor but we can try oh we can try We can try, we can try. Thank you, uh, David Trolley. That was beautiful. Uh, a great song to follow up uh, after if I had a hammer, we can try. Well, it's, it's just fun for me today to introduce our guest speaker. Reverend Dr. Jim Gaither was my metaphysics teacher in seminary uh, 16 years ago and has just been a name in the unity movement for as long as I've been in the unity movement, which really dates him, I'll tell you. And <laughs> Uh, I remember reading Jim Gaither's articles in Unity Magazine uh, right after I discovered Unity, and he's been a presence in the movement for 45 years now, I think we decided before this started. Do Reverend James Gaither was ordained a Unity minister in 1979, 
has an MA in philosophy and a doctorate in theology. He has taught in unity, ministerial, and spiritual education for over 25 years and has been the minister in unity churches for over 12 years, including Eric Butterworth's successor in New York City. The New York City ministry named him Pastor Emeritus. Jim also served as president of Holos University Graduate Seminary and director of academic and student affairs for Unity Worldwide Spiritual Institute. He's been a regular contributor to Unity Magazine for over 35 years. He's published two books, The Essential Charles Fillmore and The Hidden Realm of God, The Historical Jesus and His Healing Philosophy. In addition, Jim was co-host of one of Unity FM's first weekly internet radio programs. He is a recipient of the Charles Fillmore Award for Visionary Leadership from Unity Worldwide Ministers, Ministries. Please help me welcome my friend and colleague, Reverend Jim Gaither. Thank you, Richard. What a, what a wonderful introduction. Uh, uh, I, uh, I do remember, there, there are certain students that you remember and, and others that maybe your memory is a little bit more vague about, but Richard is one I, I always remember because of his, uh, his joyous energy and he always makes me think of the kind of person who likes to make good trouble and uh, you know John Lewis um, so I, I really I really appreciate the invitation to be here and uh, uh, and the opportunity to speak to you good folks in the uh, unity of Davis uh, I also want to thank David for his wonderful music David has uh, like a perfect folk voice I don't know if a folk music voice I don't know you've probably been told that but I really enjoyed it this morning so uh, we'll just jump right into it. Um, the, uh, when the uh, people suffer from illusion of uh, separation and division. That's kind of one of the sources, maybe the main source of what we call problems and challenges and conflicts, this illusion of separation and division. The illusion is generated, I suppose, uh, by our imaginations when we look at the world and think that we are somehow separate from it. We think of our, our bodies, for example, as isolated from our surroundings, but the truth is that the, what, we, what appear to be the, the borders of our bodies, our, our skin, I guess you would say, appear to be the borders, do not separate us from our environment, but actually connect us to it. But we nevertheless have this notion that we are separate, that there is division. We forget that uh, our field of consciousness encompasses the entire universe from a particular perspective and everyone around us has, has another perspective that also encompasses the entire universe. So I'm in your field of awareness, you're in my field of awareness, and all of us are sharing in our perspectives, our unique perspectives, on the fundamental reality of the universe and the unity of the universe. So we have these ideas of uh, separation, which cause us to behave sometimes in ways that are self-centered or selfish, that cause us to engage in conflict, to judge others. These judgments, these, uh, the, the, the fear that we experience from thinking that we're somehow separate from the good of the universe, these kinds of things, and, and the belief that we're separate from God, these kinds of things create challenges for us, maybe most of our challenges. And when we, when we realize that we suffer from and act from this illusion of separation, we come to realize that that is an illusion. We realize also that the solution is consciousness of oneness, consciousness of unity. If the problem is an illusion of separation, then the solution is the real awareness or consciousness of oneness. And this is where the idea of mysticism comes in. Mysticism really fundamentally is about perceiving the depth of the unity of the universe, of our oneness. Usually it's understood as our oneness with God. Mysticism consists of people who hold to that vision and also engage in various practices to try to realize it more deeply. But if you can see the fundamental unity of the universe from a spiritual perspective, if you grasped that and if you are able to act from that consciousness of oneness then you are a mystic regardless of whether or not you've had any deep or profound or strange what are called mystical experiences those experiences help 
people come into a realization of oneness, but they aren't necessarily the only way of coming into that awareness. In fact, another way to come into the awareness of oneness is through metaphysics. The distinction between mysticism and metaphysics is, is really not terribly complicated. You may think of a person as a, as a mystic who pursues a consciousness of oneness with God through various usually spiritual practices. Metaphysics is a, is a branch of philosophy and it seeks to find the first principles or the most general principles of the universe. It seeks to find the fundamental reality, underlying reality of all things. And so very often through history, various philosophers, metaphysicians have through their reasoning power, through their inquiry into the nature of the universe, have realized that underlying all things is a fundamental unity. And so one may come into this awareness through mysticism, one may come into this awareness through metaphysics. One may come into this awareness sort of spontaneously and intuitively. And I think people sometimes have that sort of experience when walking in nature. They just have that flash or that feeling, that consciousness of oneness. But that's the solution. Today, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, unity and its connection deep in history to some of the origins, very specific origins of both mysticism and metaphysics. About two and a half millennia ago, there lived a man named Pythagoras. Now, you may have heard of Pythagoras from high school geometry, maybe the Pythagorean theorem. It was, uh, if, you've, um, if you've ever watched the movie, The Wizard of Oz, the first thing the scarecrow says when he gets brains is he, he cites the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> and uh, so it was sort of a sign of intelligence. But Pythagoras was uh, much more profoundly influential on the history of both Western uh, science and thought than most people realize. He contributed to the development of mathematics, music theory, science, metaphysics, and mysticism. So he's kind of a legendary figure. We don't really know with a great deal of accuracy or concrete proof all that, all that we might know about Pythagoras as an historical figure. We mostly know him as a legendary figure because he didn't write anything and he, his, uh, his community, his spiritual community, basically was a kind of secret society. And so what we know about Pythagoras comes later through people who were familiar with the Pythagorean communities or new people in them or even maybe part of those, that community. Pythagoras was one of those legendary figures who was believed to be and reputed to be a wonder worker. It was said that he could control the winds. He could cure the sick. He could speak to and communicate with animals. So he's quite a remarkable figure. According to the stories that we have about him, he, he was born uh, on, on an island just off of southwest Turkey, an island called Samos. But from there, he traveled widely throughout the world as, as it was known at that time. He went to Babylonia, Phoenicia, and Egypt um, to study, to find out what they knew about, mainly about uh, arithmetic and astronomy and because those were the centers of learning in that era. And then what, at about the age of 40, Pythagoras moved to Southern Italy to a city called Croton. And there he gave speeches in the public square and attracted a large group of followers to, his, to a way of life that he advocated. And he formed this society, these spiritual communities, if you will. They weren't just communities of spirit, they were communities of learning and exploration and discovery. And interestingly, and much against the grain of that era, uh, Pythagoras's, the Pythagorean community included uh, women. So it was both women and men, which was very unusual for that time. And so the women could come in and, with the men and study mathematics and music theory and the spiritual teachings of Pythagoras. This is one of the first examples. It's, it's the first example that I know of historically of a community that held all property in common. No one had any private pop property. They shared all their possessions and they ate all their meals together, common meals. This model of community 
was then later adopted by the Essenes, who you may have heard of, and by the early disciples of Jesus, according to the book of Acts. So this, so you can see that he, Pythagoras was, was a mathematician, he was a musician, he was a musical theorist, and he was a mystic. He wrote nothing, so we only know about him from what other, others said. Supposedly, he is the one who coined the term philosophy, lover of wisdom. He was reputed to be an expert on all religious rituals. There are stories that a Mongolian shaman came to visit Pythagor the Pythagorean community and learn from it, and also to teach in it. He taught, according to the legend, he taught um, Pythagoras the stillness of ecstasy, the stillness of ecstasy. It is known that Pythagoras and his, the members of his community would, would practice long periods of meditative silence. According to the legends, an initiate had to go through a period of five years of being silent. Now, as a student of philosophy, I find this nearly impossible to believe that a group of philosophers could be quiet for five years. It just doesn't seem possible to me. So that in itself is something of a miracle. Pythagoreans had dietary restrictions. There were uh, some reports that they were strict vegetarians. Others said that, well, they, they, uh, they had restrictions on eating certain kinds of uh, animals, but not others. So we don't, we don't know exactly what was going on there, but evidently their, their diet mainly consisted of vegetables. Um, one of the vegetables that they would not eat, uh, they would not eat beans. And as you can imagine, the Greek comic writers had a great deal of fun with the fact that Pythagoreans would not eat beans and made up various reasons for it that I'm sure I'm just going to leave the punchline to those jokes to your imagination. But he had various uh, prohibitions, and, but these prohibitions were understood to be kind of mixed, mystical, maybe paradoxical or obscure sounding sayings that the students would contemplate in order to discover a deeper meaning and possibly enter into meditative states in which they would experience, sort of have a sort of ecstatic experiences. They also used music for uh, meditation. One of the things that Pythagoras, an example of those kinds of sayings was, uh, he said, do not sit on a bushel. You might recall that Jesus said, do not hide your lamp under a bushel, do not hide your light under a bushel. Pythagoras said, go not by the public way, you might recall that Jesus said, salute no one on the road and strive to enter by the narrow door. So these kinds of sayings, similar to Zen Cohen's, were used as a point of focus to move beyond the sort of normal linear way of thinking, which is unusual for mathematicians, by the way, to move beyond that linear way of thinking and to att attain a deeper insight into the fundamental unity of all things. Uh, Pythagoras taught Harmonics, that was uh, in music theory is where our term harmonics actually comes from. And in um, language, our, our, our understanding of what rational means comes from the word ratio, which was also a term that the Pythagoreans, Pythagoreans used in exploring geometry. Pythagoras reportedly in deep meditation could hear the music of the spheres. You've probably heard that phrase. The music of the spheres was supposedly a kind of symphony created by the movement of the planets in the heavens. As they moved, they created tones, which created this kind of symphony, and supposedly he could hear that. But it's a beautiful idea. Uh, so the Pythagoreans, in addition to trying to understand mathematics and geometry, they said everything was made of number. And what they meant by that, or apparently meant by that, was that Every form, it has its own sort of geometry, and every sound has its own mathematical ratios or harmonics. And so different numbers for the Pythagoreans symbolize not only a sort of mathematical structure underlying the universe, but also certain qualities. For example, Pythagoreans believe that the number one was the origin of all, that all things are made up of the one and all things proceed from the one. So you have this idea of a fundamental origin of all things in the divine one. Then the number two represents the duality of the material world, the, the realm of illusion of separation and division that is sometimes occurs. The number three represents harmony where unity and duality come together and so on. So each number had its own sorts of qualities that they would 
contemplate. And you could see how as they listened to music and thought about the harmonics of it, or they thought about the nature of numbers or these paradoxical sayings, they had all kinds of experiences that uh, became part of the culture of the Mediterranean world uh, and, the, and the pursuit of the mystical experience through contemplation and music that comes from the Pythagoreans. By the way, they also believed in reincarnation. They believed uh, that, the, that souls are reborn into other kinds of living forms, either human or animal. According to the legends, Pythagoras even remembered some of his previous incarnations. They believed in the divinity in all humans and in all animals, and sometimes referred to God as our father. There are several versions about how Pythagoras died, but what we know is, I'm sorry, how Pythagoras died, but what we know is that his community buildings were burned down by people, locals, who were opposed to the Pythagoreans and their, their various ideas. He may have died in that fire, he may have escaped and, and died elsewhere, we don't know. But that's the, that, that wasn't really the end of the story. The, the community continued on after that event and became, a, as I say, a, a secret society which nevertheless influenced the development of Western thought well into the early 19th century. Pythagorean ideas about math and science and, and music and metaphysics were sort of continually part of Western thought and, and influenced various thinkers, including some of the mystical uh, metaphysics of Western thought. In fact, uh, our understanding of the universe, the Copernican theory that, uh, where Copernicus hypothesized in the 16th century that, that in fact the earth moves around the sun rather than the other way around, uh, reportedly Copernicus got that idea from reading writings by Pythagoreans. The Pythagoreans believed that the sun was the center of the solar, solar system and the earth and the planets revolved around the sun. So they continued to have this long lasting uh, influence in Western thought. The, uh, many of the advanced physicists today have a kind of uh, uh, Pythagorean view on the nature of the world, that the world is, that the scientific picture of the world is really a mathematical picture. For example, Sir James Jeans, uh, a, a great mathematician, physicist, and astronomer of the uh, 20th century, said this, the essential fact is simply that all the pictures which science now draws of nature which alone seem capable of according with observable observational fact are mathematical pictures, mathematical pictures. The famous Erwin Schrodinger, who most of you know, at least probably from the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the image of Schrodinger's cat, the idea or the puzzle of Schrodinger's cat, who's a great quantum physicist, 20th century, said an interesting thing that fits well with both uh, our, our thrust of metaphysics and mysticism. He said the overall number of minds is just one. This is what he concluded from his quantum physics. The overall number of minds is just one. Went on to say, I venture to call it indestructible since it has a peculiar timetable. Namely, mind is always now. There is really no before and after for mind. Now I bring this, this whole long, rather long story of Pythagoreanism to your attention because while the, the influence of musical theory and uh, mathematics and so on continued through the ages, what was lost from that community and their ideas were, were, were their mystical practices and their healing practices. It was not until the 19th century uh, that another form of thought and practice and community emerged the, uh, the, the, that uh, a community, a, a belief group that uh, synthesized metaphysics and mysticism and healing as the Pythagoreans had done so many centuries before. That group, that organization, that community is New Thought. New Thought has brought together once again metaphysics, mysticism, and healing. And we see this specifically, of course, in unity. The Pythagoreans believe that all reality is based on numbers by which they meant what we might say necessary truths or ideas, right? So that the universe, the foundation of the universe is not material, but one might say mental. It is 
a foundation of ideas. And of course, that is what New Thought is, believes as well, that, that God is infinite mind and that divine ideas are the basis of all creation. So we revived that metaphysics and we've revived the emphasis on mysticism and their relationship to healing. Charles Fillmore actually explicitly linked his thought with the thought of the Pythagoreans. In one, in one chapter of one of his books, it was called The Healing Power of Joy, and Jesus Christ Heals. Charles writes about Pythagoras. He said, Pythagoras taught that the universe is God's symphony, and that all the suns and planets sing, they swing their way through the heavens. The whole universe is in vibration. Each particular thing has its rate of vibration. Charles went on to write, that an eminent British astronomer, I think he was talking about Sir James Jean, an eminent British astronomer says that he discovered that God is a great mathematician. And the logical conclusion of all wise philosophers is that everything in the universe, both seen and unseen, unseen under mathematical law. The very hairs of your head are all numbered, said Jesus. So Charles made a connection between this idea of mathematics and the statement of Jesus. Charles went on to say that when we know that every word is mathematically linked with certain creative ideas and that divine mind has made it possible for every one of us to draw upon these ideas mentally, we have the key to all creative processes. So I found it very interesting that Charles made that explicit connection with the legends of the Pythagoreans. And one thing to realize is that this notion that the universe is structured as a mathematical, uh, the universe conforms to mathematical ideas is an idea that the universe is fundamentally orderly, that there are harmonics or harmony at work in the foundation of the universe and that we ourselves are perfect harmonious ideas in divine mind. We ourselves are part of, are founded upon that fundamentally perfect harmonious, orderly uh, ideas of the infinite mind, of the divine mind. And just as the Pythagoreans emphasized the contemplation of truth, and the exploration of truth in order to experience this ecstatic realization of divine oneness, we have in New Thought also a mystical dimension. New thought and unity are not just about intellectual contemplation of metaphysics. They're not even just about the use of affirmations and prayer visualizations for healing. It's also about entering the silence and ultimately experiencing a conscious union with the divine mind. This mysticism of new thought is especially clear in some of the early writers like Horatio Dresser, whose parents studied with uh, Phineas Quimby, one of the founders of new thought, Emma Curtis Hopkins emphasized mysticism, Ernest Holmes, uh, Joel Goldsmith, Emmett Fox, and of course, our own founders, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. Charles writes a nice, concise statement of this idea of the possible union with divine mind. He wrote that God is an omnipresent mind, enfolding and penetrating all things. There are goodness everlasting and joy beyond expression in a perfect union between your mind and this perfect mind. The mystical tradition recognizes that to have this experience of a perfect union is an experience that cannot be fully described in human language. It is a joy and a love beyond expression. So we see this goal of mysticism, this mystical union in new thought as it was found also among the Pythagoreans. And just as they, the Pythagoreans were interested in healing, so are we. That original Pythagorean community had a kind of a holistic approach to healing. It included what they had in their diet. It included music, as we mentioned. It included dancing. That was their form of exercise. It included community religious spiritual celebrations and it included solitary contemplation and meditation. We see this holistic approach again in New Thought, very specifically in uh, the, the works and the community that the Fillmores found at Unity. The Fillmores had ideas about health and healing that were holistic. They advocated not only prayer and meditation, but they also advocated singing. Charles thought singing was good, not only good for the soul, but good for the body, good for our spiritual state. They, 
they advocated and, and held and organized community activities. They had a specific vegetarian diet, not unlike uh, that diet of those early Pythagoreans. And Charles even held ideas similar to Pythagoras regarding economics and community. Now, what I'm about to share with you, you may not be aware of, and I hope it's not shocking, but Charles wrote this. The remedy for all the ills to which flesh is heir lies in conformity to the divine law that Jesus revealed to his true followers. It is said of these true followers that they were of one heart and soul, that not one of them had aught of the things, said that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. So long as the idea of covetousness is lodged in the human mind as its dominant generating factory, factor, there can be no successful community life. As long as we hold to covetousness, he says, there can be no successful community life. And he went on to say that idea must be eliminated from the mental plane first. That's the spiritual work. The next step, he said, the outer practice will then be safe and successful. Then he said this, and this, by the way, is interesting. It's in the book on prosperity. Charles wrote, everything belongs to God and all his children are equally entitled to it. So there is this idea among the Fillmore's and in Charles' mind that there is a possibility of sharing that will allow all people to prosper. That if we eliminate this idea of separation, which includes covetousness and greed, if we eliminate that from consciousness, we will begin to see a more successful and harmonious community life. Well, obviously the Fillmore's were more influenced by the Bible and New Thought writers than they were by Pythagoreans, but it's just interesting to see that they had this fundamental idea that combined mysticism, metaphysics, and unity, that Charles was even aware of some of the Pythagorean ideas. And of all the New Thought groups that have been formed, the one that has been most successful in terms of attracting attention and individuals and activities in the community, the one that's been the most successful named itself after a number. That's us. Unity means oneness. Oneness is the origin of all things. We're aiming for oneness with God, oneness with each other, unity within ourselves, the establishment of integrity. And so this is the challenge that is set before us today, is to help dissolve that illusion of division and separation. As members of the unity community, we must set our sights and hearts on striving for this consciousness of oneness, on eliminating this illusion from within ourselves of separation and division and helping others attain that same consciousness of oneness. So let us continually affirm our oneness with God and with all good, regardless of appearances, regardless of what things look like. Continue to know that absolute oneness. Let us seek to continually dwell in the awareness that we are one with God, one with all people, one with the universe. From this perspective of unity, we will attune to the music of the spheres. We will radiate harmonious vibrations wherever we are. We will be instruments of healing for our souls, our bodies, our homes, our neighborhoods, our places of work, our nation, and our world. And so I invite you to hold these thoughts now. We are in unity with God and all people. We are in unity with divine love and wisdom. We are in unity with the divine ideas of harmony, health, and abundance. God is healing the world through us now, and so it is. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much. More to come from Reverend Dr. Jim Gaither. Uh, in his workshop that starts a week from Monday, August 30th is the first date. So a few seats left, sign up uh, online. And uh, now it's time to move into our offering. And if you enjoyed what you heard here today, through your offerings, we're able to bring these programs to you. And so we give thanks for your contributions to this ministry, whether they come electronically or by check or cash, whether you are 
a member of our virtual community or, or were a member of our physical community and are a member of both, we give thanks. And to give, you can go right on the website and click on online giving, or we're happy to receive your check at Unity Center of Davis in Davis, California. And so our offering blessing, if we could say that together, is divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I am grateful. And now, please join me in our peace song. prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. I am that light. The love of God enfolds us. I am that love. The power of God protects us. I am that power. And the presence of God watches over us. I am that presence. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. <laughs>